Hello, everyone. Welcome to Overcoming Silos and Divisions with Evan Bernstein. I have just a couple of housekeeping notes before we formally get underway and are waiting for our attendees to join. Feel free to use the chat box to say hello from wherever you are in the world and use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask Evan a question during today's presentation. My name is Jill Felicio, and I'm a member of the class of 2000 and 2013, as well as the Director of Advancement at Harvard's Division of Continuing Education. I'm delighted to welcome you today for such an important conversation, and we are thrilled to have attendees joining us from six continents and more than half of US states. Now, in my role at Harvard, I'm privileged to work with the Harvard Extension Alumni Association Board of Directors and several hundred exceptional volunteer leaders around the world to create professional, social, and learning opportunities for our 30,000 plus fabulous global community members. Today's event is one in a series of virtual events that we are running throughout the year to bring you topics that are relevant to the day and hopefully enriching for you both personally and professionally. Evan Bernstein is the new CEO and National Director of Community Security Service, CSS. He came to CSS from the Anti-Defamation League, where he was the vice president of the Northeast Division and sat on the national senior management team. As a nonprofit leader for the past two decades, Evan has fostered close relationships with both local New York and national law enforcement and has been a leader in responding to numerous acts of anti-Semitism across the United States. Evan speaks all over the world about the need to protect and secure our Jewish communities due to the unprecedented rise of anti-Semitism. He has been regularly quoted in local and national news sources, including CNN, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, and he currently sits on the Governor of New York's Interfaith Advisory Council, the New Jersey Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness Interfaith Advisory Council, and recently sat on the New York City Public Advocates Hate Crimes Task Force. Evan earned a Bachelor of Arts from Western Connecticut State University and a Master's from Harvard Extension. He is currently an appointed director on the Harvard Alumni Association Board of Directors and a member of the Harvard Extension Alumni Association Board of Directors. It is an understatement to say that Evan is an incredible ambassador for Harvard. So without further ado, welcome Evan. Thank you so much, Jill. This is really a, an honor to be, to be on this with you and you've been such a great partner in my journey uh, as an alumni and uh, I'm thrilled to do this with you. So I really deeply appreciate it. Great. Evan, do you want to take a few minutes to tell us about you, about your rise through Harvard, your professional life? Sure. I mean, Harvard for me was, was really one of the most uh, seminal and life-changing moments in, in my professional uh, and adult life. Uh, growing up uh, in a home where working uh, in education in, in the nonprofit space was something that was, was critical. My mom was uh, worked in that space, was also ended up becoming the vice principal of my middle school. Uh, diversity, inclusion, uh, you know, working with others was, was important. Being Jewish, but also, you know, inclusion was so important. My father was a nonprofit leader growing up watching that, working as a civil rights leader in southeastern Connecticut and in the London and New Haven uh, communities, uh, experiencing that and ultimately having a career that led myself into that space, really mimicking a lot of what my father did. My dad worked at the United Way. I started my career at the United Way of New York City. Uh, we kind of flip-flopped. My father, uh, I didn't go into education like my mother. My mom has been a huge influence on in my life, but uh, professionally, I didn't go that down that road, but I did follow my father's footsteps in the sense that uh, my dad started his career as, as, you know, in, in the Jewish communal space, starting in the JCC Jewish uh, uh, Community Center space in New Haven and then in uh, New Jersey, but then want, pivoted into the secular space with uh, Health Systems Agency, the United Way, and then ultimately um, as a very long time executive director of Big Brothers Big Sisters in, in New London, Connecticut, but used that pulpit uh, for much more than just the mission of Big Brothers, but really used it as a bridge building opportunity and civil rights opportunity. Uh, I was backwards. I started my career uh, in the United Way, in more of the secular non-Jewish communal space, and then w w went in the middle of my career into the communal space. And uh, right in the middle of that career in my early 30s, uh, 
you know, after, you know, a lot of experience and even some senior level positions, uh, I knew that I had to be able to expand my, uh, you know, my knowledge base in order to really grow professionally. My father always said, listen, learn about fundraising first and then become an executive because once you're an executive, you're going to need to, have to learn how to raise money. Uh, uh, and I did that. I followed in those footsteps really the first 10 years of my career were predominantly in the development space, predominantly in senior positions in development, for raising money. Uh, but ultimately, I wanted to become an executive of my own organization, uh, running that organization programmatically and through you know, financial responsibilities. And, and when I moved to Boston to become the national director of development for an organization called the David Project, uh, I, I was looking for a master's program. And I came, I, I just happened across the, you know, the, uh, on a website search on Google, the Harvard Extension School. Did not even hear about it before I moved to Boston, you know, did not know about it. Uh, was looking to look at BU or Northeastern. And then all of a sudden I found this, this program uh, for nonprofit management that was part of the management program uh, at Harvard Extension and started really going in, looking into it, went to the, to the information session and started that journey uh, in, in 2000 and uh, late 2008. Uh, and then, you know, graduated in 2011. And it, is, it just is the game changing experience for me on every level, the management program, the case study model, you know, learning and doing at the same time, being able to have those conversations with board members, being able to have those conversations with professors. It was just a, a, a life-changing experience now to the point of, you know, post Harvard, having, you know, one of the most senior positions at the Anti-Defamation League, and then now, uh, you know, being the CEO of a major national organization in our space and, and being able to use the civil rights experiences and be able to use development and be able to use programmatic development and, and financial understanding, all of which I got so much from uh, my ALM program. Uh, you know, I couldn't be a luckier person. And now to be such an active alumni uh, on, the, on the HAA board, on the HEAA board, uh, and be able to do something like this today, it just, it's, it's a dream come true and, and I'm really honored. Well, that's great. There is, you know, a wonderful uh, moment on video for anyone who wants to see more about Harvard, um, Evans Harvard's story. He's shared it in an information session in Sanders Theater, what, two, three years ago, Evan. So it's, yeah. been, it's been a little while. But what jumped out at me when you did that was just how rich your Harvard experience was and the opportunities you had. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about the work through the Hauser Center and yeah. And your other opportunities that were unlocked at Harvard Extension that really added to your portfolio? Yeah, so, uh, you know, thank, thank you. so I, I was lucky enough in my second year, I graduated in three years, my second year after be, gaining admission uh, to the program, I was selected to be uh, at the Hauser Center uh, for Nonprofit Organizations. There's a student advisory board, which is at the Kennedy School. Uh, they only picked 20 students from across Harvard uh, to be on that board, to be able to really help analyze what Harvard was doing with nonprofits and NGOs and, and what their coursework was looking like, uh, you know, for NGOs within the different schools of Harvard. And it was an amazing experience to be with other Harvard students from Harvard College and Harvard Law, Harvard Medical, uh, School of Public Health and other, other, other schools and having those conversations. And that was really, honestly, honestly for me, I, Jill, and I've said this before, I really felt like I was fully a part of Harvard. I think I know a lot of us as alumni, we're in our, you know, har, you know we're, we're not traditional students. We don't have that residential experience. So I think while you're at Harvard, trying to find something that you could be part of uh, that is at Harvard on campus or something that you can join while you're there that gives you, a, a, you know, interaction with other students. Uh, and that was a tremendous experience for me because it just, you know, so what one of uh, Caitlin Powers, who was on, in that group with me, actually went on Shark Tank and, and got a deal with, uh, with Mark Cuban. Uh, for some of her ideas. So, I mean, there's amazing people, uh, you know, that are part of that group. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's just about trying to be as proactive as possible and trying to, to, to be proactive as, an, as a student and then even proactive as alumni, because now, mm -hmm. become, you know, by doing that, being active and then staying in touch with alumni and staying in touch with, with, with you, Jill, and, and, you know, having the opportunity to now be on the HAA and now building relationships with other graduate school directors and other members of the Harvard Alumni Association, it just helps immensely as you're trying to do this work because you can get different perspectives mm -hmm. from other alumni. You're having access, uh, to, you know, the, to President Bacow and other leaders within Harvard. And, and those things just enhance your ability to be a better professional. And it gives you opportunities. And the HAA board, the HAA board, the Extension Alumni Board, 
also has tremendous each uh, Harvard Extension alumni, which you become close to and, and are building relationships with. And, and these are ongoing relationships that are only going to help you and enhance your, your relationship with Harvard, but also more importantly, help you professionally. And, and I go back to what I've learned, you know, at, How at the Hauser Center and what I've learned in my, my graduate program and what I've learned even now uh, in my Harvard alumni capacity, uh, mm -hmm. those things I draw from on a daily basis in my work. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, just an incredible experience. And really, for any of you still a student, relish those opportunities now, but know that there's a whole chapter awaiting you as an alum with uh, so much to do and so much good potential for collaboration, which we will get into. Evan, can you talk um, a bit about your work at the Anti-Defamation League and uh, what you witnessed during that time? It's a really interesting time uh, in history to be part of the Anti-Defamation League. Can you give us just a little bit more about that experience? Sure. Uh, I was at EDL for seven years. I was brought in by uh, the longtime national director uh, who was there for over 50 years, Abe Foxman. He brought me in. Uh, he's an icon in the space. He uh, was a Holocaust survivor and brought me in to run at that time the largest region in the country, New York. And then they went from the New York to New York to New Jersey and then became the vice president of, of the entire Northeast and all the offices in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. but, but what I saw over that seven year period was indicative, I think, of the entire country was really normalization uh, of anti-Semitism. EDL was, is, is one of the oldest civil rights organizations in the United States, but primarily focuses on anti-Semitism, uh, but also civil rights of others, clearly. Uh, but what I saw in my seven years there was a normalization of anti-Semitism. When I started, if there was a swastika that was painted on a synagogue uh, or in a church, it was a major news story. Uh, I would be at the press conference. Uh, mm -hmm. It would be big news, uh, big reaction. Uh, by the time I left the EDL seven years later, uh, there was barely a blip if there was a swastika put on a building. There was barely a blip if there was an assault, anti-Semitic assault. Mm -hmm. And even saw less when there was, when there was murderous acts towards Jews, uh, which I was there on the ground for. I was on the ground, literally on the ground during the act of sheer uh, in Jersey City at the kosher market where law enforcement now know that they wanted to go into the yeshiva and they literally went to the wrong door uh, that was only two feet apart, the two doors. They went right instead of left into the market. They wanted to go to the yeshiva. Uh, and I was there within an hour after the Muncie stabbings at the Hanukkah party next to the synagogue. Uh, and, and the reaction that we saw to those acts of murder were supremely less than what we saw uh, after Pittsburgh and even Charlottesville and those other acts of hate, even certainly Poway in San Diego, where, where there was a shooter there in the Abad synagogue. So the normalization of hate that we saw towards Jews and the reaction to the community, and then starting to see uh, you know, things happen in public schools that we never saw before, or we maybe saw it in the 50s and 60s, but we didn't see it in the 70s, 80s, or 90s. But we started seeing it in public schools. We started to see government officials saying certain things that we never imagined, I never imagined, and I had to call out uh, on the both the left and the right that were, were, were really very big differences from when I saw uh, the seven years, you know, from when I started to when I, when I finished my career. And I certainly, in my conversations with, with my, uh, and being on so many interfaith councils, important councils, like with the governor of New York, having those conversations with other faith leaders, it wasn't just the Jewish issue, while I was seeing that, it was other minority groups were also feeling this rise of hate, this normalization of hate, and acts of hate to those, to those communities. And uh, you know, it was it was a crazy time, and still is. We're in that moment still, uh, but seeing it in kind of technicolor in real time over that seven year period, and uh, it, you know, it was uh, really unprecedented, and, and it was it was really shocking and very saddening to me as a civil rights leader. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you mention, you know, community leaders and elected officials, and they were making statements that surprised you. Um, you note that this is bipartisan. Uh, are you finding this on both sides? We certainly did. I mean, I I called out members uh, uh, of both parties from both sides of the aisle. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the acts of hate that took place that I had to deal with either locally or it was a spokesperson nationally, uh, you know, they were coming from different sides. You know, if you look at what took place in in Pittsburgh and Poway, uh, those are white supremacists. If you look at what happened in Jersey City and Muncie, that was not white supremacy. Uh, if you look at what happened in Brooklyn, uh, that was not white supremacy. 
uh, those, the, you know, the, the acts, of, you know, the, the numerous uh, uh, acts of uh, physical violence that took place in the Jewish community, uh, you know, over a two or three year period. You know, so I think we certainly saw it uh, from the right and the left. I mean, we saw it, especially after Jersey City, we had uh, elected officials that were uh, more from the left that were, you know, were saying that the Jewish community deserved uh, what happened in Jersey City and had to call that out. So I, I think it was, this is not our right or left problem. Unfortunately, hate is, is from both sides. And, and I certainly saw it and had to comment on it uh, more times than I ever imagined. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's, it was you know, incredibly disturbing, but I, I, I find it very hard when, when people you know, out in the outside community are saying it's only from one space or the other. What one person I had to call out vehemently on that was Mayor de Blasio in New York, who kept calling everything that was happening in New York you know, issues of white supremacy. Where it just wasn't, uh, and I was it was one of the few uh, you know civil rights leaders that that called the mayor out for that. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, this is an issue that that, that crosses uh, the political spectrum, and I think we we do ourselves a disservice as a society when we try to put it in particular silos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, have you noticed that, you know, within um, large organizations that there is also a kind of a polarization happening among board leadership, uh, donor bases? Are you finding that these silos are being you know, created in that organized fashion? Are they shifting? Yeah, I think what's happening, unfortunately, is it, it, everything that's happening in our social spaces, or I think are happening even in the nonprofit spaces, based on what I'm talking mm -hmm. to my colleagues and you know, have a good network of, of people in the Jewish and non-Jewish communal space that work at NGOs around the United States. And I think what we've seen over the last seven years is as the moderate middle has dissipated, you're seeing that even with your friends. I, I have very close friends, people that were in my wedding party that I don't even speak to anymore because of this polarization. And I think what you're seeing now, even on nonprofit boards is, mm -hmm. you know, nonprofits are having to make decisions on where they stand. You know, certain nonprofits don't have to necessarily do that. If you're in the American Cancer Society, it's a non-political uh, mission, it's mm -hmm. a little bit different, you know, for those organizations, organizations that touch or potentially touch any part of the third rail uh, in the NGO space politically, it becomes very, very complex for the nonprofit leadership and, and how they are going to respond, uh, you know, publicly to certain issues mm -hmm. uh, can make or break a board because you certainly have a, br a broad makeup. Uh, and as the moderate middle dissipates, uh, you have leaders that are having to make certain decisions that are not going to make everybody happy. And so you see certain boards that are maybe moving farther to the left or farther to the right, uh, uh, either based on the leadership of that board or, or where the, you know, the, even the, the, the NGO leadership wants to take the organization. And it's becoming harder for an organization to stay in that moderate middle because it just doesn't, it's not there anymore. Uh, it's becoming no man's land. It's almost quicksand. Uh, if you have, you know, if you're not in a political space, like I said, it's, it's a lot easier. You can probably hold on a lot better, but if you are any kind of political space, and everything now seems to becoming more pol pol uh, polarized and politicized, mm -hmm. it, it becomes harder and harder, and you almost have to make a decision mm -hmm. because you're going to lose your funders from the left or the right because no mm -hmm. one's willing to stay in that middle, which is becoming harder and harder. Yes, that's interesting. And you know, talking about other factors, do you have any thoughts, you know, on the media in general, the role the media plays, or social media for that matter, and the way that that I think social media, that? social media has been, I think, one of the biggest perpetrators of hate. Uh, it, I think is actually the, the biggest change that we saw over my seven years, because when I started, uh, Twitter was just getting take was taking off, Instagram was just taking off, you know. Facebook was 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 getting there, but wasn't. It was still was still not fully fully baked yet uh, in our society. Uh, by the time I left, that's how a lot of hate was being perpetrated and perpetuated across the country was through these platforms, mm -hmm. uh, through blogs, and through uh, you know you saw a tremendous amount of Holocaust denial and other things taking place on Facebook. Uh, you know, tremendous amount of hate on the right and the left being spewed on Twitter. Uh, picking up you know tens of thousands of followers, people that are not experts, people that are not political pundits or even educated news sources that are just, you know people that just like the messaging, they grab onto it, and all of a sudden you see somebody on the right or the left that has 100,000, 200,000 followers, uh, and people have started creating their echo chambers, which I think led to their uh, the dissipation of the middle, because what happened was with social media uh, before when you, when I was younger, you had you know, major news sources either. In, in, you know, that were that had to maintain a broad base because it was the only game in town. Uh, and you had the three major networks, and they had to you know talk to the right and the left. Now people 
can pick and choose exactly what they want in their echo chamber, and mm -hmm. they can unfollow anybody that doesn't necessarily believe what they believe. So within a, a short period of time, people are only getting what they want. They're not looking at anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is the right and the left. This is not just one, one side or the other. And they're not seeing differing views on other things. And when that happens, hate can really metastasize. Uh, and intolerance can really metastasize. And I think uh, social media platforms have to be held more accountable uh, for the content. And people mm -hmm. talk about free speech, but if you look at the social media platforms, these are private entities. These are traded on, the, on, on NASDAQ or on, on the Dow. If, you know, they have every right, uh, just like the New York Times does, not to run a particular ad as a private entity. Mm -hmm. They have every right to, to, to monitor what's being said on those platforms as a private entity. Mm -hmm. uh, free speech is incredibly important in this country. And if somebody wants to walk down the street with a swastika on the t-shirt, they have every right to do that. Uh, but these platforms certainly can stop the perpetration, you know, the perpetuation of hate uh, mm -hmm. on their sites because they are private entities and they have every right to do that, mm -hmm. like any private entity does. Yes, I mean, it seems that there's, you know, psychological factors at play, you know, that perhaps um, the need to fit in to find your place. I mean, you know, I, I'm reading all the time about, you know, studies related to people who are feeling isolated by, you know, say politics, they're feeling left out of social spectrums. Are you finding that there is something at the heart of this? Is this a fear? What do you think it is that motivates people in this way? Well, I think it's, I think certainly COVID doesn't help. It pushes everybody online. You are alone a lot more. Uh, mm -hmm. I think you know, there's, there's always been a swath of people that are looking for this. Uh, the ADL did studies uh, for decades, since the 60s, about anti-Semitism. We believe anti-Semitism is a canary in the coal mine in the sense that if anti-Semitism is, is rising, other forms of hate are rising as well. Mm -hmm. And in the 60s, it was about 30% of the American population was anti-Semitic. And now you're dealing with about a 14% of the American population. We, when I was at the EDL, they would define that as anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. uh, that's still about 30 million Americans. Mm -hmm. So if you get 30 million Americans to have the opportunity to, to now start communicating with each other in a way they couldn't 15 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, maybe they were just talking to their buddy at the bar, you know, spouting things off. Oh, that's crazy. Whatever, whatever, let, let them go. Or, you know, to a couple of friends in an AOL chat room, you know, 20 years ago, it's a lot different now. Uh, it's a lot easier for people to get onto these chat rooms to get, and build their hate and get with like-minded people. And we saw that with, with you know, Pittsburgh and, and Poway, those people were getting radicalized online. They were using online platforms. The shooter that was in Germany uh, over Yom Kippur, who was unsuccessful because of the security, which hopefully we can go into uh, protecting institutions, especially Jewish institutions, that those people followed those protocols. That person with the shotgun could not get in, uh, uh, but it was filming everything to be live on, on social media. So I think that this is all, and you know, we saw the same thing in Christchurch uh, in, in New Zealand where they were filming everything live streaming. This is having tremendous impact on young people. Young people now, we, we remember, you, know, you and I, Joe, remember when this was not the norm, when mass shootings were not the norm. Uh, now this has become normalized because of social media. Mm -hmm. uh, stories that would never even reach us uh, are now reaching young people. Uh, they're, they're starting to see things that they never would have seen before as teenagers in America or young people in America. Uh, and it's changing what their cultural norm is. You know, and, and I think it's changing a lot of hearts and minds and maybe kids that were more, that could, were, were, could be pushed in certain directions are getting there before they're fully mature, uh, before they can make those decisions. Because it's very hard as parents to filter what, you, what these kids are, are reading and seeing on social media. And, mm -hmm. and, and it's impossible to pr protect them from this stuff Yet it's all out there on Twitter. It's all out there on Facebook. They can get it very easily, and it's and it's really disturbing mm -hmm. and very scary as a parent and as a leader in our in our community. Absolutely, yeah. At the de degradation of social norms. I know I have children, and every day it seems I tell them this is not normal. There's so much going on that I want them to know should not be status quo. But I mean, you've you've really kind of set the stage for kind of the hill that we're climbing here. But do you um, can you Talk about the work that you've done, say, in building coalitions in terms of like, where do we go from here? I know that you've established partnerships and working relationships that are truly 
um, silver linings to that terrible seven years. I mean, you've gone above and beyond to make build bridges that are meaningful and that can be solutions to this. Can you talk a little bit about that work, um, specifically the work that you're doing, uh, you know, with uh, say Black Catholic leadership and interfaith initiatives? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm very fortunate when I came to the EDL, I had a background with two parents that cared very, very much about civil rights. Uh, it was in my home. It was part of my family. It was, I, 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 I experienced things with, with communities of color uh, and others. The other was very important in our family uh, with both my mother and my father and certainly in my father's work. Uh, and so to have that and then be, even be able to get into a position of civil rights with the EDL, it was a natural for me. Uh, but I learned a lot because I learned that that not every uh, you know I was a very lucky Jewish kid that was understanding you know these relationships because if you look in the '60s you know uh, Jewish and Black leaders walked together over over Selma, uh, the bridges at Selma, and they were there for you know the '50s and the '60s and Brown v. versus Board of Ed and, and and as there was white flight out of a lot of cities, those relationships really dissipated. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's a lot more separation. If you look at the Crown Heights riots took place in Brooklyn, uh, that was really on, on big time display, unfortunately. Um, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of bridges have been built since that, uh, that period of time in the early 90s in Brooklyn, but it was really a, a microcosm of that separation of what took place between the black and, and Jewish community that everyone still looks at in the Jewish community, what mm -hmm. took place in the 60s. But if you talk to African-American leaders, that's a long time ago. And there's certainly certain leaders that are still maintaining those relationships and they're doing great work, but, but, but a lot has been lost. And, and, and I think that was where I kind of came in with, a, with, with the parents that, that were telling me those kind of bedtime stories. I had a very unique opportunity to try to come in and try to build those bridges. And, and I was very lucky uh, to, to find connectors through, through my work. And, and you know, I think the best example of that was after meeting, building a very close relationship with, with Borough President, Eric Adams in Brooklyn, who was the uh, first African-American borough president, uh, who was former NYPD, I, I got to work with his director of faith initiatives, uh, Pastor Gil Monroe's. And, mm -hmm. and Pastor Gil Monroe's is now really one of the most prominent uh, African-American, he's a Caribbean American, but African-American pastor uh, in New York City. And is, is, is tremendously prominent uh, over everything that took place with George Floyd and, and, and really was a primary leader. And not only is the faith, you know, faith leader uh, for the borough president's office, but also the, is, has his own church. And he's also uh, somebody that um, created the, the 67th Precinct Clergy Council, which is now a national organization that really helps with gun violence uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in New York. The, the 67th Precinct where he is, is one of the worst, uh, the most acts of, of, uh, of gun violence in, in the United States, it's, uh, mm -hmm. maybe except for Chicago. And so getting very close to him, uh, opened my eyes to, to what was going on in the black community. And I think we had great dialogues which were taking place in the Jewish community. We, I actually went to Israel with seven black churches. He led that mission. Uh, I've been to Israel numerous times, but never walking in the footsteps of Jesus and, and going to places I never would have dreamed of going to as a Jew, uh, going to parts of East Jerusalem, the Mount of Olives, uh, going to, you know, to, to, uh, you know, just the places that, that, that I never imagined uh, going to with a completely different lens and having conversations with these average citizens who were on this trip. It was a trip of a lifetime for them. They saved up their entire life, but, but they lived in Brooklyn and they were living close to other Jews and, and having these conversations with them about, they didn't know what Shabbat was. They didn't understand what kosher was. They didn't understand what Passover or Yom Kippur was. And, mm -hmm. and having these basic conversations, I was flabbergasted. I'm like, you live within a few blocks of, 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 tens of thousands of Jews. Now I understood why there was the divisions. I'm like, now it's time to get to work. Mm -hmm. And so we started building more coalitions and started doing more work together and doing work together with other pastors on sunny days. I, and I think, you know, as we promoted this talk, it was about building these relationships before there was a Pittsburgh, before there was a Powell. Mm -hmm. it, it, so when something happened in the black community that I knew what was going on, I could try to help them as much as I needed their help. And I think it was about trying to find equity in those relationships and doing it in a way where it's a real friendship, not just a business transaction, but a mm -hmm. real, real close relationship uh, to the point where Pastor Monroe and I went to Poland together. Uh, we went to Auschwitz-Birkenau together. We went, we started in Warsaw. We went to the ghetto together and walked the streets where we saw, you know, memorial after memorial uh, of Jew that, Jews that were murdered 
in the Holocaust and then going to the gas chamber, literally walking to the gas chamber together at Auschwitz and then driving to Birkenau and being on the back fields and, and, show, and, and seeing myself for the first time and him for the first time, the ash pits that are still there of Jews that were killed in the Holocaust and then walking the back fields of Birkenau on, on, on one of the most beautiful days I've ever seen, he ever saw and said, how could anybody have been killed here? And walking the back fields and saying to ourselves, literally, we said this, you know, could Hitler imagine a Jewish leader and a black leader walking on the back field of Birkenau, talking about how we are going to build bridges with our communities and, and, and do that work together. And that's really where things uh, got together. And, um, you know, we've been totally committed to one another. And through those, we built other relationships within our communities, uh, and really working with other faiths. And now it's culminating with my work uh, at CSS. We, we, we co-created also with Rabbi Bob Kaplan, who is a tremendous leader, interfaith leader, uh, who worked a lot also with, uh, with Pastor Monroe's. Uh, the three of us have, have now founded the first ever Interfaith Security Council for New York City. Uh, even though I'm a national organization, we felt it was important to start this in New York. We have those relationships where the three of us are going to be bringing to, around the table faith leaders from, from the Muslim community, from the Sikh community, from the Baptist community, from the Seventh-day community, you name it. Uh, we're, we're going to have leadership from around that table. That's the diverse uh, uh, in New York is. But that never would have happened if it wasn't for those early relationships, those early coffees, and then all that work together. That now we're doing something that no one thought could happen. It's creating this interfaith council, not only that's going to help build bridges and create conversations about our, 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 our faiths and our backgrounds, but also doing it around security, which is so important because it's not just a Jewish problem, it's a problem that's impacting other communities as well. In my role, my role is clearly you know, securing the Jewish community and I've seen firsthand the horror of murder uh, in Jew at Jewish institutions. I've seen it with my own eyes. I never thought I would, but I have. Bullet mm -hmm. holes in the synagogue, um, you know, bloody, bloody scenes of, of, of murder. Mm -hmm. uh, I never thought I'd see that. But I do know that this is not just our problem and we need to, to, to have those kind of conversations in order uh, to, to make this world a better place. And if I can use my pulpit now at CSS to help with that on top of the work that I'm doing to secure our commu Jewish community, uh, then I feel, feel honored and I feel it's really special to be able to do that. Wow, I mean, I can't imagine anything more impactful and bonding than that trip. I mean, it seems that the relationships that you've developed there are deep and strong and related, I think, you know, on a shared value and a shared purpose, which is wonderful. I mean, I wonder if you can talk about how to develop that relationship. You know, how, to, how do you get it started? Do you have any practical advice for people who want to forge a relationship like that that's so meaningful or you know advice to people who are working with colleagues that they need to form a, a, a relationship with or open a communication channel do you have any words of wisdom yeah. there for people i think first of all everyone brings their own biases to everything in their own conversations i remember my first conversation with pastor monroe's i thought at that point there were starting to be more and more assaults in, in brooklyn towards jews and i'm like we need to bring this program I'm, I'm selling this we need to bring i think this is what we need to do and i don't know him it's our first interaction. I don't know him from anything. I don't know his experience. I don't know what he's going through. I don't know what his people are going through. I have my own opinion. It's, a, it's, it's, it's a, an opinion that I developed on my own and I'm trying to sell it to him. And what he taught me, what I learned from him was you got to slow down. You got to listen and find out where the other person's coming from and, 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 and put off to the side your belief a little bit and listen. And I learned really quickly that we needed to, you know, that the perception was that the Jewish community didn't really care about what issues were taking place within the black community in Brooklyn, which was gun violence. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, I'm gonna do everything at that moment to try to help him on his issue. And I think then that will lead to him understanding my issue. Then we, then we can figure out programming and having conversations. And that's where I started partnering with him around gun violence in, in Brooklyn and gun violence abroad, including Chicago and elsewhere, really helping him. I'm on the board now, the clergy council. Mm -hmm. So it's, <laughs> So it went from that conversation of just not even understanding to that, to now where well, he's going to Poland with me and we're talking about anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. So I think if you're with, with your, in your family the conversations or with your colleagues or your friends, it's, it's have a dialogue. Don't box yourself off. We, you know your own opinion, but let someone else talk. 
Let them express themselves. You may not agree with them, but the more conversation you have, you may actually find yourself listening and actually maybe agreeing. You may not agree on everything. I don't agree with, you know, with other faith leaders. I don't agree with everything that they're saying, but we agree on certain core things and we focus on those core things and we work together on those core things. Mm-hmm. Don't throw everything away because you don't agree on one issue. Instead, flip it and try to find those issues that you do agree upon and that you can work with. And there's some people that, yeah, you can't. It's too big a divide. I understand that. You're just too far off base on certain, certain core things that are, that are so important to you. I understand that. But, but if you can find that common ground, if there is that area to have that conversation, maybe it's feeding the homeless. Maybe it's you know, clothing. You know, you know, maybe it's a clothing drive. Maybe it's whatever it is, you know, what it is. You can find certain things that you can build those bridges on that kind of, you know, pushes those third rail things off to the side. It's not easy. It's becoming harder and harder, as you said, as you, as you, as you put yourself in that echo chamber. Everyone's doing it. I'm even guilty of it. But trying to get yourself out of the echo chamber, trying to get your kids to mm-hmm. be out of that echo chamber. You know, one of the things that I did is I had my daughter do her bat mitzvah project at Pastor Rose's church, get her to Brooklyn. Let her experience mm-hmm. the other. I live in a Jewish echo chamber. I'm in my own little, you know, my little world. You know, our kids, no matter where we are, we always are like that. Uh, and it's, it's hard to, to get to understand the other when you're an adult, if you don't experience it as a kid. It's one of the great things my mom and I, my mom and my father did was they exposed me to the other at a very early age. So I, I think it's imperative that we do that for our kids. Mm-hmm. I think it's imperative that we start having these conversations amongst ourselves and not let this continue to metastasize and work super hard. If you're involved in a house of worship, try to find another house of worship that you can partner with. Mm-hmm. You know, try to find that colleague that you can have another conversation with. Don't go in automatically, you know, assuming certain things like I did or, you know, early on in my career with, with certain faith leaders and just driving your agenda. You know, it's really easy to drive your agenda. It's a lot harder to listen. Uh, and I think if we can try to do that, do more listening instead of talking, I think we'll be a lot better off. And we can build those bridges and break down uh, some of those silos. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what strikes me, you know, just listening to you is the notion of we all need to get comfortable with being uncomfortable, right? I mean, I think, you know, that that's something I think it's a challenge to everybody, regardless of where you lie on the political spectrum or beliefs, religious or otherwise. Uh, finding the other and communicating with the other can be a bit of a challenge. And I wonder, are we better off just getting off of social media, leaving the computer, having these interactions, you know, either on Zoom with each other and away from these echo chambers. I mean, really, what can we do? It's a challenge for you as well. Do you have any proactive tips? Do you have a, a media diet, say? Do you uh, force yourself to look at media you wouldn't, you wouldn't ordinarily look at? Or well, I, I, I have to because of press and, and, and what would actually acts of hate are taking place and you know, from a security standpoint, it's, it's mm-hmm. really important that I'm on it. So probably on social with a different lens than, than, than the average, average American mm-hmm. is. But I, I do think that uh, you got to limit yourself a little bit. And I also you try to use social media to, as a positive. You know, try mm-hmm. to make a chat room, you know, share something good every day. I know it sounds really mm-hmm. corny, but, but try to find what I think. One of the things I'm doing on YouTube is I'm trying to find really, there's a lot of positive, unbelievable stories, you know, like where a guy comes back from, uh, from Iraq or something like that, or Saudi Arabia, and he sees his kid for the first time, puts a smile on my face, you know, or people are listening to certain, you know, Whitney Houston's rendition of, of the Star Spangled Banner, Banner at the 93 Super Bowl. Like that puts a smile on my face. I think it's really easy to go to the negative. There's a mm-hmm. lot of really wonderful things too, but also trying to maybe create some chat groups that you can get mm-hmm. some other people or get your, 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 your church or your synagogue or your mosque or whatever to, to build I chat, and then you say, well, this is a positive space and we're going to try to find positive ways. And I know it's hard during COVID to do a lot of this, but COVID is not going to be here forever, God willing. And we'll be able to get back to doing work together. But you can start setting a lot of that stuff up now. You know, you can start, you know, you can do a lot of programming with other houses of worship or other groups um, right now. Get it planned for, for the fall or, you know, or for the winter and get it on the calendar and start building those conversations on Zoom. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think social media has, has a positive. It's not all negative. I think it's just the kind of lens that we want to put on and how we decide to use it. It's unfortunate yeah, that it's been used. It's unfortunate it's been used mm-hmm. for such negativity. 
Right. Do you think, though, that the pandemic offers some opportunity to break down boundaries and to have, you know, virtual interactions that might not be possible in person? Is there any silver linings to this time? Sure. I think it'd be, imagine, like, uh, you have a church in, you know, a synagogue or a mosque in a church having, having conversations. What do you have in common? Mm -hmm. A lot of the holidays are the same. You know, a lot of things are the same. You'd be amazed at how similar people are than they're not. You know, uh, and I know hard. It's hard with certain ideological things, but you can always find people that that you can find things to share with. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a lot of wonderful, you know. And I think that's those are wonderful things you can do. There's there's lots of programming you can do uh, over Zoom. You know, you can just have a conversation. You can talk about let's do a food drive together. Let's do, you know, there's a fundraiser in the community. There's ways of building those bridges. You know, I, I you know every community is different. I think it's important that the clergy really start building those relationships and hopefully the clergy are then talking to their congregants and then the, and those congregants can help get those, get everybody active uh, to do the good work. Yes, absolutely. Well, you know, the chat is full of just very interesting um, observations and questions. There have been a couple of references to QAnon, say, and people that, you know, may have, um, I guess some feel radicalized opinions. You mentioned maybe 30% of people, you know, come to social media for, for hate purposes. What do it's we do? Than, I would say about four, it's about 14%. I would say oh, all, oh, right. so, yeah, so 14% four, we felt that the American population was anti-Semitic. If someone's leaning okay. towards anti-Semitic tendencies, that means they hate everybody. Okay. <laughs> they if you're hating Jews, you're, you're hating a lot of other people as well. And so mm -hmm. those are the people that are probably more prone to go onto a social media and, mm -hmm. and use it uh, from a hate perspective. Right. So what do we do with that? Do we, uh, social media companies, is there an imperative on them? You had mentioned earlier today to filter out the hate speech, to get rid of it, uh, to take it down. Is there a, a government regulation that might be urgently needed for these groups or is it truly? Well, I, think it's a platform. I think the platforms themselves have to start taking responsibility. And when I was at the EDL, we had the Center in Technology and Society, which was based in Silicon Valley mm -hmm. in order for uh, the EDL to monitor and work with uh, those platforms to be in their backyards. To you know, mm -hmm. if there was if Facebook was doing something, don't just call them up. Go to the <laughs> have the meetings. Right. Talk to with the leadership. I think it's imperative that that these that these platforms don't just worry about R and D. Uh, you know, for their to build their stock price, they need to also focus on their their social responsibility. Mm -hmm. And I think it's imperative that as Americans who are using these platforms and paying for the use of these platforms that we are, we're holding these platforms accountable for the impact that they can have. So I think a lot of this has to be driven by the American population. And I think also organizations need to hold these, these organizations accountable because they are private entities and they can't control what's on those platforms. Right, and you know, and there's been great references to education. Your Harvard education obviously uh, made you so equipped for this and gave you skills in terms of building these bridges, especially with the nonprofit program. Uh, oh, do you have is. any any thoughts about how schools, say primary schools, high schools, can start educating the next generation of kids who might be hearing this and thinking this is normal? But how do you fight this with kids? You've mentioned kids a couple of times now. I think you know. Learns it, hates to learn behavior. No one comes out of the womb hating anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, and they learn it from their social environment at home. They're learning from social media uh, and, and they're picking it up in other areas. So mm -hmm. I think schools need to be as proactive as possible as more and more kids are, are learning this. And we're seeing bullying rates that are, that are skyrocketing. Uh, and just because it's COVID doesn't mean these things are going to disappear. They're, they're going to come back. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's imperative that, that schools do everything in their power to proactively get in front of this and get in front of hating. Uh, they need to do everything to, they can to, to get the young people early and start programs uh, mm -hmm. around uh, you know, diversity, uh, around the other, and having those conversations and, and having open dialogue. Because if it doesn't, it, it can metastasize. And I work with school districts in upstate New York where there was you know, lawsuits against the school district who just kept trying to bury uh, the anti-Semitism and the hate that was taking place in that school to the point of where 14 families came together for a lawsuit and the school district lost that lawsuit. Um, and so I think that, you know, and we're, we, as we're starting to see more and more of this in schools, uh, public schools where, where this kind of hatred, people are mimicking what they're seeing online. They're bringing it into the classroom. They're, they're targeting certain individuals uh, mm -hmm. with certain backgrounds and in schools can't bury their heads in the sand. They have to get proactive and, and they have to find the right 
uh, the right balance of including that that into traditional education. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, as parents, we can advocate for that within our school systems and fight for it. That's right. Uh, can you think of any other, uh, while we're on the talk of organizations, education, any other resources that we can uh, provide for people or give, do you have any advice on where to go, you know, where to get started when people log off of Zoom today? What do they do? Well, I think you, I got to talk, you know, first, first of all, you know, look at your school, your school district. I mean, talk to your clergy if you're involved with clergy. I think it's important. You know, this is a great opportunity for, for, for your, your, you know, for, for faith-based leadership to really be, mm -hmm. be a part of this. If you're a congregant, as a congregant, you have a lot. Uh, I think in schools, I think it's really important uh, to 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 find out what your school district is doing. Uh, you know, are they involved with ADL, who who does No Place for Hate? Are they involved with Facey mm -hmm. History and ourselves, which is another very prominent Boston-based uh, anti-hate. Uh, organization that goes around and works with schools all over the country. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of a lot of uh, organizations that do that. W what is your school doing? How are they How are they handling this? Well, how are they having those conversations with young people? Uh, mm -hmm. How are they going to try to change the next generation? Uh, but I think as adults, it's it's about you know hopefully finding that maturity if we can and, and, and getting us out of that comfort zone uh, and being willing to take a risk and have those conversations with people we maybe would not uh, have those conversations with. Uh, and getting yourself out of that comfort zone, which is very hard for us as adults, mm -hmm. uh, trying to find that way to do that uh, as best you can, either through an NGO or through your, or your church. Uh, but then certainly with young people, I think it's about finding out what your school district is doing uh, to, to push back on this and educate young people. Yes. I mean, ultimately, it seems that the imperative is on us to get involved, get involved in some way. And it seems that you know, obviously uh, I'm biased and as are you, but Harvard has just a gazillion resources to get involved, you know, through the Harvard Extension alumni community is uh, robust and has lots of opportunities to meet people from all over the world. Yep. I think if you're a degree holder, the Harvard Alumni Association certainly has Harvard clubs and shared interest groups where you will meet a very diverse group of perspectives. And that's a wonderful place that strikes me to begin. Uh, do you have any other ways? I mean, do you you think about, uh, you encourage people to join boards, to get involved with community organizations. Yeah, I think you have a natural dialogue, you know, being on the Harvard Alumni Board, we're having great conversations about mm -hmm. what's going on in the world and you're, and you're around other people. As you said, even successful people that may have very different opinions than you do and very different backgrounds. And I think it's part of you getting out of your comfort zone. So I think mm -hmm. finding the time to volunteer, finding those boards that you could be on, especially here at Harvard, uh, when you're an alumni, it's, it, there's a lot of things you can do. Your Harvard clubs are also very, uh, very diverse. You know, I'm very, I was very involved in the, uh, in the, you know, the Harvard club in New York. Uh, we also have the HEAA, the Harvard Extension Alumni Association groups that are in all over the country. You, Jill, have, you know, really revolutionized that and, and expanded it, you know, dramatically since, since 2011, since I graduated. It's, you know, so now if you're in any in major city, you, you really have an opportunity to be with a diverse group that, Again, Harvard's the common denominator, but you certainly can do and have other conversations politically or socially that are that are great because you have at least that common denominator, which is Harvard. So I think Harvard can be a real bridge for especially for people on this call that are that are affiliated with Harvard or be graduating. Uh, there are opportunities galore, uh, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of it has to do with you, Jill. Honestly, you've done a tremendous job. Oh, well, thanks. No, honestly, I think, you know, what's evident to me from having visited, you know, 30 something cities to meet our population of Harvard learners is that we are intimately connected by the work that we did at Harvard that, you know, obviously the, the difficulty of working and going to school and completing a Harvard degree and balancing the demands of family and life is something that's quite extraordinary and often uh, people outside of your, you know, Harvard direct connections won't understand that. So right. people that come uh, to these events, I think, are intimately bonded by that experience. And it's it really is a Harvard family and especially a Harvard Extension School family, because what we've done, I think, is is truly exceptional. So this is a wonderful venue, I think, to uh, to challenge yourself, to learn others' opinions. We have, you know, events across a spectrum of opinions like that's really important. And I think Harvard does a good job of encouraging listening listening and argument, good, you know, well-founded, well-researched arguments. And I think that that's a wonderfully productive thing. So, you know, and Evan, I, you put yourself out there to represent Harvard every day. And I really appreciate that. I think, you know, the, the good work that you do is evident uh, at Harvard and beyond. It's incredible. But bringing this back home uh, to people who may be thinking, I'm working in an organization that's quite siloed. 
Um, as Harvard itself is quite siloed, we are 12 different schools. I mean, talk about a, yeah. a siloed organization. Do you have any advice for building bridges across silos in the workplace? I, I think it's, it, it's, it's if you, management needs to figure out ways to define those common denominators and again, not politicize mm -hmm. uh, certain things. And I think there's a lot of opportunities for, for within a workspace that has a diverse political or, or social background work, uh, space. Mm -hmm. uh, you're seeing more and more of that now. A lot of companies are bringing in diversity officers. Uh, they're mm -hmm. bringing in uh, you know, HR professionals that can help uh, build those bridges. And I think it's, it's important to find professionals that can help do that. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there are expertise in the field that can help do that. I think companies don't have to do it alone, but I think you need to find professionals that can help do that and create programs within the workplace mm -hmm. that will allow for those kinds of uh, those kind of com conversations in safe spaces. I think it's a lot of times employees are afraid of it because mm -hmm. it's not a safe space sometimes, or they don't feel that it's a safe space. And I think it's it's mm -hmm. it's imperative for companies to create those safe spaces for those kind of uh, those kind of dialogues uh, to take place and have them, uh, you know, where people can feel free to, to share that, but not, you know, where, you know, where someone's not feeling obviously threatened or 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 put in a position where they're they're fearful. But certainly having differences of opinion and having those kind of conversations, mm -hmm. I, I think is critical. So I think I think it's imperative for 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 institutions to, to to do it on their own, but find professionals as they're especially at the height of where it is now that can really help do that. Don't try to do it on your own. Uh, you know, get help when needed uh, mm -hmm. in order to, in order to do that. You know, for me at, at CSS, which is so amazing that we have our volunteers that are out in front of synagogues that are that are protecting our synagogues. We're, mm -hmm. Our volunteer base is from a broad spectrum uh, of the Jewish community. We have volunteers that are super far to the left. We have volunteers that are super far to the right, yet they're standing in, in, in doing security for their, for their synagogue uh, every single uh, you know, Sabbath, mm -hmm. regardless of their political differences or social differences. They're on the same team. They're rowing in the same direction. And they, they know that there's one thing that's, that's pulling them together which is safety and security of their friends and families inside of that synagogue and protecting their community. And they put all that other stuff aside while they're protecting that community. And that, that's something I get to see mm -hmm. on, a, on a daily basis. This is large group of you know, over 5,000 trained volunteers that are, that are all there with totally different backgrounds yet are rowing in the same direction uh, on, one common, on one common area. So it can be done. Mm -hmm. It's something that can happen. I see it on a daily basis. I tell you, I see it on my own team. I'm on two teams doing security. I know certain people on those teams are completely in polar if the opposite directions politically, dramatically so. Yet on, on when it comes to doing that work as a volunteer, they put it all aside and they get done what needs to get done. And mm -hmm. I think that's one of the beauties of CSS of the work that I do, but I see how it can be done. And if it can be done at CSS, it can be done in other, in other, other areas as well. And that's why we're working so much right now with other faith leaders. We're actually starting the first interfaith uh, security council in New York City, uh, Rabbi Bob Kaplan, myself, and Pastor Monroe, who we talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, the three of us are starting an interfaith uh, security council where security will be a top of mind for other faith leaders from around the city, whether you're Sikh, you're Muslim, you're Catholic, you're Protestant, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. We're going to have that common denominator of security with the hope that we can start building those bridges on the back end, knowing that protection of our communities is the number one focus, mm -hmm. uh, whatever community we're coming from. But, but again, utilizing uh, uh, that common denominator of security as a, as a way to have, build those bridges and, and break down those silos. Oh, well, that's fabulous. I mean, the one thing that has always struck me about you, and I really genuinely appreciate, is that how you have a lot of optimism for what's to come, and you're tireless in your pursuit of fighting hate, which is really wonderful. Do you feel good about what's to come? Do you feel optimistic, or are there things that keep you up at night? I'm lukewarm. I'm lukewarm. I, I think if we can get the next generation right, and we can educate them, and we can really train them on, on social media, and that this is not the norm, uh, I think we have a real chance. Uh, I think I worry, you know, I saw a dramatic rise in hate. Uh, over the last seven years, uh, still mm -hmm. seeing, you know, even as doing security, you know, volunteer security. Now my synagogue, I've had to deal with, with instances already, even during COVID that I never imagined I would mm -hmm. see. Um, so I, it's hard for me sometimes to be optimistic because I've seen some really horrific things, mm -hmm. but I have my own two children and I try 
to believe that it has to be better for them. Mm -hmm. And we have to start getting better and healing as a country and, and, and start finding those things that, that instead of divide us, uh, bring us together as hard as it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I'm cautiously optimistic, to put it that way. I, I do think we, we need to have a huge Herculean effort mm -hmm. uh, to change where we're going. But this country is, is, is an amazing country and we're very resilient. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we need to start coming together from, from the right and the left and, and, and start impacting young people now uh, mm -hmm. to get them back to that moderate middle that's so critical. Yes, absolutely. Well, we are, are getting to the bottom of the hour here. I want to echo the thanks that there has been in chat. I want to raise them to your attention. You are a fabulous example of Harvard and Harvard Extension and the work that you're doing and fabulous advocacy and tireless effort to fight something that really does feel like a mountain at times. So thank you for that. I want to give you any any last words for our no, participants. I just, no, I just want to say, you know, thank you to you and the whole, you know, a team at a Division of Continuing Ed and, and Extension and uh, Veronica, who I know is on this call and everyone else has been so helpful since I started really getting involved, Veronica Olson, uh, as an alumni. Um, everybody has been just tremendous and it's been really one of the, the best things I have outside of my professional life other than my family is, is all the stuff I get to do with Harvard and, and being on the HAA and in the, you know, when we could travel to to Cambridge and it just, it's such an amazing thing to be. And I can't wait to be with you, Jill, at the next Harvard uh, Yale game. That's, you know, a Harvard stadium and, and experiencing <laughs> that. And uh, uh, I want to give a shout out, you know, I already give a shout out to my dad and my mom. I want to give a shout out to, to my, my mother-in-law and my father-in-law. So we're huge supporters uh, of me at Harvard. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you know, just were a bit amazing, you know, when I was at Harvard and, you know, so supportive asking questions every day, what was it like? What's it like? What's it going? What are you learning? And even as an alumni, what are you doing? What are you doing? You know, it, it just they're awesome. my biggest fans and, and my wife, Heidi, and, and who's been allows me to do all this stuff. So, um, yeah. you know, it's important that they, they're part of this as much as anything. Yeah, absolutely. My goodness. Well, thank you. It really is meaningful. So I encourage anyone out there who has uh, you know the, the willingness and the ability to come on over and think about volunteering, come out to events, join us virtually. There are so many wonderful people to meet and you will not be sorry. So Evan, thank you so much really oh, for your pleasure. time today and for everything that you do for Harvard. And everyone joining today, thank you for giving us uh, the hour and your very thoughtful insights and questions, which we were monitoring as we uh, had this discussion today. This event will is recorded and will be captioned and available for viewing later, so feel free to share it. And in the meantime, we will see you virtually until it is safe to be in person, which we hope will be soon, but we just don't know at this point. Uh, so stay healthy. Uh, please stay involved and best wishes to you. Thank you, Evan. Thank you so much, Shel. Bye, everybody.